Usually in our post-show chatter before we record or go live, we generally have a bit of chit-chat about the game, what we thought, general general talking points from the game that we get into. And before this podcast, it was a downbeaten crew from the Huddle Breakdown that couldn't muster much more than that's pretty shite, wasn't it? So it's not going to be a positive Huddle Breakdown podcast for you if for anybody who's listening or watching on YouTube. Celtic are out of the Europa Conference League, out of Europe again, uh, failing to get past the knockout stages and muster up any sort of performance. It was pretty poor overall over the course of the 90 minutes in Boda Glimt. Uh, changed Celtic squad, not probably the changes that we would have expected going into the game, but we'll try pick through this as much as we can and we'll get back to our daily lives and try move on with everything before the weekend. Alan Morrison, James, how are you getting on? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So look, it's it's hard to know where to start with this, but we'll start with the starting lineup that Ange put out. It was a lot of changes, not the changes that we would have thought. We probably would have thought that he was going to change the midfield that he put out against Buda Glimt and maybe go for a bit more energy. But he went for inexperience, shall we say, in the second leg of the Bodo Glimt tie. This was the first surprise. And I, Alan, I think you sort of tweeted in a manner of such that I didn't expect this from Ange because it was very, very much like he was passing this game off as a defeat already and move on to the, the league, essentially. Yeah, I, I, don't, I can't. I mean, Oscars and Oscams Razor, as um, James will no doubt correct me in terms of that I can't think of any other reason, I, and I'm and I'm I was just shocked because I honestly believed that he would be and would be you know going all in really to win every to every game and every tournament, um, and therefore we put out the team best best suited to winning the game. And I tried to rationalise it, and I, and I was rationalising it, thinking, well, it's a more physical, slightly more athletic team. We've got a lot of six footers in there now. Um, the sloppiness in the final third was one of the main reasons, you know, for for failure last week, and we've now got Maeda and Forrest in the wide areas who are not as prone to just making risky passes and giving the ball away. They're probably going to recycle it and keep it. So maybe we're going for something a little bit more patient. But then he went up with Rogic and O'Reilly again, and then you drop your best defender and you don't play your captain. And it just, I just was completely confused by it and, and didn't know what to make of it at all. Um, I can only conclude that he, he had actually just, just you know, given up on it, really. I mean, why, why else would you make those changes? I still don't get the Rogic and O'Reilly thing, especially as, you know, within nine minutes, they've carved us open four times and scored, playing through the gaping hole that was still there from last week and <laughs> hadn't gone away he's still there yeah. that big hole <laughs> that huge hole was still there so, uh, yeah. so I, just, I just i just i'm trying to i'm trying to make light of it now but that's not how i feel inside <laughs> it, it was like when i when i saw it, it was it was like when we kept repeatedly seeing the combination of you know scott brown and others in the midfield last year where you just knew what was going to happen? You like you knew they were going to counterattack, and that's exactly what happened, James. Yeah, I think we can. Uh, I'm going to st- steal your job here, and uh, maybe we can call this episode. If we don't laugh, we'll cry. And because there's a lot of that going on in the world right now, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I don't. Um, you know, so the, the, the amount of because I, I actually had the same or similar thought as Alan. It's like, oh, okay, well, we're going big and physical and we're not playing Livingston. You know what I mean? It's the, they, they keep the ball on the deck for the most part. Um, you know, the, the amount of their aerial passes was about, you know, a third of what a Livingston would do on us on the, when we play at Livy. You know, the, the nightmare of going to the Tony Macaroni where we get to enjoy that in about a week here or two weeks, I guess it is. Um so I, I, I don't think that made much sense. And, and I share the other views that, that Alan's already um, stated. And I, I think you compound that by, um, you know, the fullbacks that were played and that center back pairing relative to a pressing team. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it was really not great and predictably so. 
Uh, and then, you know, you throw in the fact that guys didn't really have a, a very good game like Bitton. And um, the, the only other thing I can think of is that, you know, if you, if, if, if you take the some of the more um, qualitative aspects of this game, meaning that I, I didn't do any research heading into this game relative to where they play. Right. I mean, I knew it was a, a plastic pitch. I just assumed it was probably inside. Um, you know, because you can <laughs> like a five a side hole. <laughs> well, no, I mean that, that you know no, well there's domes, there's domes now right. that you can get there. Right, exactly. Like I, I, I don't follow the Icelandic league, but I'm guessing a good number of their pitches are probably inside. I don't know. I mean, you're hmm. in the freaking Arctic Circle. I'm thinking maybe you play inside um some kind of a dome or a stadium an enclosed stadium rather than outside. So when I tuned in and I saw that <laughs> what the conditions were, I was like, Oh my God. And you know, with the temperature, the wind, the precipitation, that had to have been hell playing in those conditions. So that could have factored. I could think that could factor into it. It's like, we're walking into this absolute mess. We're already down. Um, could that contribute to maybe not playing certain guys if they have some fitness issues? I mean, they're going to play. I think was it minus thirteen or something? I heard at the, the beginning. Wind, the wind chill. As yeah, I wind chill. yeah. I mean, uh, what a hell. Uh, as I understand, it's just weather, mate. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. I, I've, I've I mean, it is. It is. It I've, isn't. I've competed isn't, athletically isn't. in those conditions, and it is hell. I mean, yeah, you but it's the don't... same for everyone. It's the same. For no, everyone. I get it, but yeah. you know, uh, yeah, but like, if, 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 listen, like. Uh, I, I get that to a point, but it's also like saying, uh, you know, the weather is anything when you're playing in 35 degree heat. If players play in 35 degree heat week in, week out, they're going to acclimatize to that better. It was, it was sort of, and yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you. There was a couple of, there was a couple of strange things from Ange before the game as well, as well as the lineup. Um, and it, it, it is the first time I've been generally kind of, you know, I don't actually agree with you here. Celtic didn't train on the pitch the night before and, and said, oh, yeah, well, we played on plastic pitches before. Not all plastic pitches are the exact right, same, right. so I thought that was nonsensical. Yeah. And then with the starting lineup as well, if he was really, well, I don't want to say throwing this game, but you know, passing this game off as a, taking the L and moving on to the league, why did he bring Abada uh, and Cal McGregor off the pit, on, onto the pitch? If you're really trying to you know, pass off this game and keep players fit for the, 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 the games in the league, don't risk your captain and main midfielder getting injured again. I mean, yeah, I, did, I just thought did, there was did, a couple did, of things like that that yeah. didn't make sense for Mines this week. Didn't even make the five subs. Again, it just doesn't add up. I agree with you 100% on the, on the not training on the pitch thing. That's, to me, that's just unprofessional, right? The, the weather wouldn't have been much different when they trained on it as it would have been on the, on the, on the night, I'm sure. And, and you'd, mm. have got, you'd, have, you'd have got yourselves, you know, st you're steeled for what was to come. I, I, don't get, I, don't, I, don't buy, I don't buy it in this circumstance. Again, I, I'm with you on 35 degree heat. But you know that weather they had last night. You know the, the temperature there was was wasn't much different to what it was in, in Lanark. Somebody to somebody tweeted. I know the wind chill was was higher, and and you know struggling in strong winds. I mean there was a strong wind. I didn't realize mm. um, until really the second half how much they had the wind in their favor in the first half. And that was part of the reason why Celtic were struggling to get out. That and the fact that Rogic and O'Reilly were like thirty yards too far up the pitch and couldn't be found. But anyway, that's another story. So, 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 yeah, it was a completely unprofessional pre set of preparations, as if we just simply didn't care, and that's completely out of kilter with what we've what we've seen seen before. So it's just a really odd one. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm I'm not saying I think it's an excusable excuse. I'm just trying to spitball as far as because it is. It's so out of kind of character and context. Uh, certainly counter to rhetoric. Um, so when people behave out of character against their own rhetoric, the question is why? As I, that's I'm just throwing what theoretically could be, and I, I mean a narrative I could come up with as to why he would have brought McGregor on and Ambada so we didn't get embarrassed. <laughs> Meaning that if you know at some point where there could have been if that went the wrong way in the second half, that could have got, and again, it was, it wasn't that they were completely dominating us, but you could see guys were kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, not real happy to be there, which again, given the, the conditions th that certainly, and, and if they're picking up that vibe, right. From leadership that this maybe isn't the, you know, players aren't stupid. They get what the, 
what the lineup is and they get the routine and why are we deviating? I mean, I could, could see all these guys kind of having in the back of their mind. Okay. What's going on here? This is different, you know? So I, maybe, maybe it was a disciplinary thing. I mean, it, maybe it was a form of punishment for some of them. I mean, not taking off Welsh scales and forest was a torture for those guys. Cause they were, they were beyond abysmal and, and to not take them off was, was cruel. Actually it was, it was, it was, you know, some kind of human torture making them run around for 90 minutes underperforming to that extent in such awful circumstances. Mm. <laughs> yeah. But the, the thing about this defeat and I suppose the reason why people are so annoyed by it is firstly the, shock and surprise of the way that we sort of went into the game but also if Celtic went into that game and put out their full team and put in a performance and didn't ultimately go through I think you you know fair enough people might not want to give Bodo Glimp the credit where credit is due but I think you can chalk this one off as you know Bodo Glimp are actually not a conference league team they're going to be playing in the Champions League and if not next year then the following year they're a good team that put us out because they're better over the, the course of two legs but to put your second team out in the second leg when they're still, you know, you can still play for this game. You can still at least attempt to go through and to put in the performance that they put in as a result, you can now chalk this down as another Celtic hounding in the knockout stages of a European competition in the same manner that, you know, the Copenhagen loss or the AIK loss. It's an embarrassing loss now it wouldn't have been an embarrassing loss if we went out to win that game and actually put in a performance. Yeah, if, if there were players carrying knocks or, or you were even just 2% unsure about somebody, fair enough, you know, don't risk them in, in, in those circumstances. But uh, you know, either either go out to win the game or or, or, or don't, you know what I mean? It's, uh, but, but if you don't, then accept, as you say, accept the consequences of the perception that, that you're then left with because that performance was an embarrassment. It was an. I was actually. I was embarrassed watching it. I genuinely was embarrassed that this was Celtic representing Celtic, and I could. I'm. I might. I might be making this up and going too far. But I honestly, there were occasions during the game I thought I could hear the home crowd laughing at some of the players trying to control the ball on that pitch because it was that. It was that bad. Mm. So. That's the feeling that we have for the game. Let's let's talk about the game itself, I guess, if we want to put ourselves through a bit of misery. Can I offer, offer one more yeah, I, go for context it. of what we what you guys just stated? I mean, I, I think it's an exclamation point to a European campaign that is like pouring salt on the wound of the last, what, 18 years, <laughs> um, which is, you know, we kind of we b barely got into Europa League. I mean, that, that that tie against Alkmaar could have very easily ended up with us um, being in the Conference League. And then, uh, I mean, we, we basically, if, if you average it all out from the European campaign, we conceded two and a half goals per game. I mean, that's just not sustainable at any level, meaning that, um, you know, so it's the way that we've gone about doing it. It's the, the fact that... Um, you know, to, to lose five one in aggregate is against Bodo Glimp. So that that's you know, uh that's clues esque <laughs> um in in how disappointing. So it's not just the level of or, or not doing well or not getting through, it's how it went down. And and that continuation of you know, this kind of narrative relative to Europe. Um, so that, that's kind of why I think it's a bitter pill because it, it really is, um, there's been so much kind of a blossoming optimism relative to the, you know, the, the January window, things kind of trending up the, the, for the most part, a, a pretty good glow around Ange, um, barring the injury issue that we've talked about. So I think that this is kind of ran against all of those narratives and, and I think that's why it kind of gives us back to PTSD of Celtic in Europe. Um, and also it's, it's, it's what's possible. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to maybe address one of the small elephants, at least in, in the room, which is you then, you then that night see, you know, Rangers performance against Dortmund and whatever, whatever whichever, whichever team you support, right. You know, try you, 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 if a balanced view might be that there's not a lot between these two teams. So the point being, if they can perform like that against a team like Dortmund, then absolutely Celtic can, right. They absolutely mm -hmm. can. So that that's that's a frustration, right? You think, well, why you know 
There's no reason. They, 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 I mean, fair play to them. That was a magnificent performance on in both legs. They absolutely deserved to go through. You know, they, they, they faced some, um, you know, looked like at one point the Germans were going to get back into it. They got ahead again. And then they actually looked like they were going to score more goals. It was it was, a, it was an incredible, incredible performance, really. And, 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 you know, you've got to give them credit for that. As a Celtic fan, I'm looking at that thinking there's no reason, because of the evidence of all the other games that have been played this season, that Celtic can't, you know, as as we've seen on many European nights ourselves, whether it's you know Lazio mm-hmm. home or away, you know games against teams like Lille who were top of the French league at, league at that time, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You know we can we can reel off performances like that, Leipzig, etc. Yeah, and I I always come back to my main point, which was sort of my most repetitive point in last season when we were recording the podcast, in the sense of the rebuild and what Celtic should be looking for. If Celtic build a squad that's good enough for Europe they will be good enough domestically. And I think, again, you're talking, we're into another year where I know it's a rebuild and you're sort of, you still have to re- retune your thinking a little bit to, to know that this is still Ange's first season and, you know, things are probably further down the line that we, than we would have expected. But we're still back to a stage now where fans are split between, oh, we didn't want to be in Europe anyway, the domestic competition is more important. Whereas it, the domestic competition will always follow what we do in Europe. If we're good enough for Europe, we will be good enough domestically. That's that's always the yeah. message that I, I want to get across because it's just it's nonsensical trying to aim domestically and then think that's good enough to transfer into Europe because it's never it never is. It never was and it never will be. Hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, it's absolutely fair. I agree with that. I will just caveat what I said before with the, there is an element of, you know, the way that the Rangers team was put together, the squad was put together, the way that they play to when they're playing well is they are actually made much more for European games than they are for domestic mm-hmm. games. They, you know, yeah. they, and actually they look more comfortable when they started packing the defence and then counter-attacking. And they look really, really effective there. Now that, that doesn't translate well to the Scottish game. And where they, where they struggle in Scotland is, is, is trying to, you know, the creativity when they've got a lot of the ball. Um, whereas in Europe, uh, under, under, under Gerrard as well, they were excellent. Uh, playing good teams and counter-attacking well. Now Celtic aren't built like that, so I think I think even if we do build a team that is good for Europe in terms of you look at the squad quality, if we're going to play like this, we better be bloody good at it, like like they were, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and 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 that will come. And I do fall back to the default of you know where we are only part way through a rebuild. We do need to be patient, and we're nowhere near complete in terms of. The squad that we're we're trying to assemble, and I think somebody on Twitter who's a, a Buda Glimt fan said, "Look, you know the guys that they had at the back, those two centre backs, right? Um, they're they're just kind of journeyman Norwegian pros. I mean, no no harm to them, right? They they couldn't play passing the ball out from the back under pressure three years ago. They've learned it. They've learned it through practice, 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 practice. And similarly, you know, Starfelt Welsh not comfortable, but you know, practice, 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 practice. So you know, they're, for, they're in their fourth year of the project." We're in the we're not we're, we're only part way through the first year of our project and we haven't got all the pieces yet. So that, that's me being positive. Mm-hmm. So will we touch on a few things from the game then? <laughs> if we must, James, want it? <laughs> okay. Um, James, James, James I, is dying to. <laughs> don't don't worry, don't worry. I'm I'm not dodging the criticism of Liam Skills. We will get to him. Um, <laughs> the forward line I want to talk about. Absolutely nothing. Like absolutely nothing from none of them. No options, no coming short, no runs down the wing. It was it like it's one thing, you know, the Buddha Glimp putting the team under pressure, but the team was under more pressure in that first half, especially because when it got to the midfield, they had nobody to pass it to. And I don't know if I'm being dramatic with that, but that's what I saw. I I it just the system wasn't working. So, I mean, Alan was talking about spatially the distance between uh, our, our back uh, six, I guess you want to call it, with Bitton and the, the back four and then Hart relative to how, how advanced the eights were. Um, you know, I, I really felt bad for Forrest because um, the physical issues, I think, were on glaring display meaning that his physical decline relative to that, their left back and how many times he was beaten for pace or just muscled off the ball. Um, you know, he's, he's just a bit of a shell of his prior self at this point uh, to a degree. Um, so we, we weren't winning personal battles. We weren't 
uh, the system wasn't working. I mean, it was just, um, you know, Maeda seemed to be doing his normal work <laughs> to his credit. Um, but the rest of it just didn't seem to be working. And, you know, uh, I, th I think understandably and reasonably and, you know, justifiably, Jack Amack has got a lot of uh, praise coming out of the hat trick. Um, but I took a look at it after. I mean, he, he's done very well against poor opposition. That's basically his Celtic career so far. Um, and he hasn't been able to do it against, he has one goal against hearts, which was a great finish on a cross that little back heel flick that he had was, was a great finish. But outside of that so far, now I'm not saying it can't happen, but, um, he, he's just not been able to do it against better, uh, opposition. Yeah, and yeah. he played well again in the Derby. He played really well. He had three good shots on target, a couple of good saves from McGregor and he, and he, you know, Gave their defenders a really hard time. So, uh, fair enough. Uh, but again, they again that was back to them um, kind of bunkering, not not playing. We didn't play an open European style game against that. That when we talked about that, it was such a no. He needs, he needs the ball, right? He's not he's not going to go and get the ball, right? He, he, yeah, he's got to be given the ball in the box, right? And that they are not that kind of team, right? So that's the, the, that's what, and most of the better teams. So that's what I was trying. I'm trying to you're. you're making it better than I, I was Alan, which is I can see him playing an important role against bunker teams domestically. And oddly enough, Rangers played that weird tactic style that we, uh, that we've talked about in that game. But outside of that, when it's kind of like out uh, free flowing and back and forth kind of play, I just, I'm not sure he's ever going to be that guy. Cause you saw it. And again, conditions, all these other, uh, uh, reasonable factors that on that pitch they hadn't played on him, and the ball was bouncing off a lot of guys. A lot of guys were struggling with it, so it wasn't just him. But he's had that issue in other games where, you know, his quality on the ball when he's doing his hold up play and that kind of thing. When the game's free flowing, it, I, I'm just worried that it, it it's going to continue to be an issue. So when you have all these other, you know, contribute that with all these other factors that were unfolding. It was a real mess overall. And I think that that's, I don't, I don't, again, this is back. I don't blame any single player here. I just think the circumstances and everything was kind of just not working right. Um, and it seemed like to a degree there was a lack of an edge as the game progressed. I mean, at times that, that work rate and the intensity maybe just wasn't there. Um, and, you know, again, they're human beings. I can get it. Um, because it was it was a mess. Hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I if, if we're gonna if we're gonna pick holes in the performance, Jakimakis would be the bottom of the list of things to pick holes on because he he completely relies on other on on service, right? And the service wasn't there because the, the, there wasn't the structure to deliver it. I've I've only watched the lap the first twenty minutes or so back, but anything that does happen is people attempting through balls down that left side and Maeda trying to get onto the ball. So he was at least trying to make something happen, making runs in behind. And I don't think he stopped all game, to be fair to him. There's people criticising him. I just couldn't believe that. I don't yeah. think he stopped. I don't think he stopped trying to make runs all, all night. But when, mm. when when you're playing against a howling gale, and once it started snowing and sleeting, you saw how how how, that, how bad that wind was. Now, normally, professional footballers, it doesn't impact the game like it would on a grassroots game where the wind would completely you know, change the manner of the, of the, of the contest. But it did in this case. Um, but so therefore, why Celtic were trying to play out from the back in that first half, and the and the eights were pushed so high, and there's just a physical incapability for people to find them with the ball, and, and you needed and you needed to actually be quite compact and play intricate passes to get through, um, was just it's just it's just naivety, it's just you know hmm. lack of a, any sort of intelligence really. I think Maeda is a victim of expectation both in his own expectation of what he's coming in as uh, like a, one of the star players of the J-League, but also because of how well Jota and Kyogo and Hatate and the rest of the signings have, you know, taken off and really like, you know, impacted the team. Although Maeda has scored goals, he hasn't really impacted much. All Like if you compared like Hatate scored that goal against Rangers. So I automatically, regardless of what he does now, he's regarded as one of Celtic's best players, as well as also, you know, playing quite well. I think Maeda is playing okay. I don't think he's playing great, 
but I think it's the fact that he hasn't really impacted a game in the, in the sense uh, that Kyogo and the rest of them have. In terms of the defence, then, it was a night to forget for Liam Scales and Stephen Welsh and pretty much everybody, let's be honest. But in, in particular, Scales down the left-hand side, very sloppy with his passing, dribbling, got caught off out a couple of times, can maybe chalk a couple of them down to the pitch, can maybe chalk a couple of them down to himself. But in terms of the goal, I mean, if you're doing any video analysis of the first game, you know not to get let that guy in, onto his uh, left foot. And that's exactly what Liam Skills did. The only benefit of the doubt that I would give him on that was uh, if that was Greg Taylor, he wouldn't have been in the box in the first place to let him into the, uh, onto his left foot. So <laughs> he, 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 in, in Skills' favor, he did well to get back. But when he got back, he didn't do the right thing. So I mean, yeah. he might as well not be there. Yeah, it was it was not good. I, it occurred to me, you know, I've talked in the last couple of weeks about O'Reilly and this notion that his brain works a little bit quicker than everybody else's, and he sees things. Scales is the anti-O'Reilly in the sense that he's not particularly slow. He's not particularly. He's a big athletic guy. I just think his brain is just that much, that little bit too slow for this level of football at the moment. Now he's young and he's he's only just joined the club and he he may well get there because he's got the physical, athletic build and frame yeah. and he's got a nice balance about him on the ball when he get, finally gets the ball under control. But I just I just I just think he's he's that is he's just that little bit too slow and I don't mean yeah. physically slow. I mean mentally slow for this level. I mean this is his what fourth European fixture ever. In his career, so I mean, yeah, like yeah. You, you do have to mention that as well. It's yeah, you know, fair enough. That's fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, the rest of uh, Welsh surprised me because I, I think he's a he seems a very confident, self confident young man and individual and player. He doesn't he, he seems to play in a very fearless manner and he doesn't seem to let mistakes bother him. But he looked really, really nervous last night. Um, and Rolson was just Rolson, I think. You know, he's on a bobbly pitch and a high wind. He's not going to master the ball, is he, really, that, that, that much. But, he, but he's going to give you everything that he's got. And, of course, he, he did. Starfelt was probably the best player on the team, and that's that's horrible. When <laughs> Starfelt's your best player, it's not good. <laughs> yeah, it's... I mean, the, the whole point of the show is probably to learn more, like to just to try to figure out like what's going on with the team and maybe take a perspective away from the game that you might not have had before, but I'm, I'm struggling to think of angles for this game that we can cover that would learn, would, would teach us anything more about this Celtic team. It's set. If, if I was saying to you before we came on it, it was in, in, it was the same as the first leg in the sense of, I mean, there was a lot of contributing factors and like you could point to the team sheet, you could point to the midfield, the different players that may not have been used to playing with each other, but ultimately it was, really just a bad performance as well as all those contributing aspects you know there was there was no intensity in the play there was no sharpness in the play the play was sloppy there was passes going all over the place and you know it was a bad day there was bad weather there was bad pitch all that there contributes to this but it felt like Celtics saved their worst two performances of the year for the two biggest games of the year in terms of the European competition it was just really disappointing and I can understand why people are frustrated by it yeah, and I again for, from a from a an actual it, it, it I think it, it similar to the first round the first uh, game in the tie I, I think that the the score line um, didn't sufficiently uh, represent the disparity and the five one didn't in aggregate didn't represent um, the disparity and and quality of play. Um, you know, it's one of those where the uh, they were ruthlessly efficient in taking their chances, and and um, you know, Hart wasn't able to make up for. I mean, he had some good saves yesterday, but you know, he could only do so much. <laughs> um, he couldn't save everything, and uh, and and you know, our guys like Might is, you know, pretty decent chance uh, yesterday. It didn't didn't finish that well, so. It, Above and beyond all of the, you know, this horrible characterization that we're, uh, I think, reasonably placing on the game, the underlying disparity actually wasn't that big. Meaning that the, that's where this qual relative quality of opposition comes in. Um, so if you kind of look at the guts of of the play, 
the underlying stuff. It was, you know, not, not a huge disparity between the two teams, uh, which you wouldn't think, obviously, I mean, at the, uh, g- given the wage budget advantage that we have. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I think it's easy to get too negative after this. Um, I, I think that's probably not uh, reasonable because of, you know, uh, some of these selection issues. I mean, I, I, I guess the, I, I'm, I feel better about the narrative that this was a um, kind of write off from Ange because otherwise it would be like, what the hell is he thinking? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what the alternative is more worrisome. Um, and the fact that, yeah, I know, guess it's not like it didn't play, maybe- show it didn't play, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of yeah. factors here. CCV didn't play. Juranovic didn't play. You know what I mean? So there's a lot of, um, you know, extenuating circumstances to this game where I, I'm not placing all of that much on it other than just saying it still feels like crap because of all of the context that I talked about earlier. But, 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 but you know, Ender's right, though, in the spirit of, what you know, why are we here and what's this show about? You know, I'm a great believer in the, if you learn something, whether it's something you, did, you didn't want to learn or something you did want to learn, right, then that's progress, okay, we've moved forward, okay. So, for example, um, you know, what have we learned about James Forrest? Now, this is going to be a really, really hard message for a lot of the support, because if you start getting into this on Twitter, you get absolutely battered, right? So the, the notion that Forrest may not recover anything like his form from two, three years ago is not a happy topic to start addressing. But we've got to be honest with ourselves. And this is a show about trying to be honest about these things. This isn't a bash James Forrest. This isn't a, you know, forgetting all the wonderful things that James Forrest has done for Celtic. This is a, let's look at his performance today, because it's today and tomorrow that matters for Celtic, not what happened three years ago and what is the best thing for Celtic, what is the best thing for the team. Okay, what did we learn about um, scales? What did we learn about Bitton trying to anchor a midfield on his own? Okay, what did we learn about, you know, Hart and Starfelt and Welsh trying to play out from the back under these difficult physical conditions as well as a, a, a very well-organised press, okay? So the, you've got, we've got to be honest and open about these things, about what we learned. And and that's what, you know, I think you remember that's that's part of the, the purpose of why we're here. Mm. Yeah, I think what we learned from most of that is that <laughs> Celtic are not a European opposition to be feared. Um, at the minute, at the moment, at the minute, yeah. I, I don't um, know how I don't know how Buddy Glint would have been three years ago, right? If they if they had their centre backs and their goalkeeper learning this way of playing out from the back and you know playing with th- only three in midfield and covering, you know, had they got their spacing right in transition and, and so on and so on and so on, right? Hard stuff. This isn't easy to play this way, by the way, right? Mm. So, I guess moving forward from this is going to be one of those things where Celtic fans immediately move on when the league comes around and you know it's something are going for the league title here as well it, it, it should be said um now that the European competition is done in terms of keeping on the theme of European competition though if, if Celtic do win the league and their Champions League qualifying in your opinions where do we need to massively improve I think some of the ones are obvious like left back position obviously that domestically that needs to improve never mind at a european level um in terms of the team the positions the style of play where do celtic in your opinion need to improve to be competitive in europe again because it's 2004 since celtic won a knockout tie in europe so that's a long time under a lot of managers can I let James have time to think about his answer to that question? Can I just, before we move on to that, sorry, just one other thing I just wanted to cover, sorry. Uh, so just before we came online on Twitter, uh, one, one of the, the guy called Forrest Finishing, who you might know on Twitter, put a great, great thread, actually. And what he did was he looked at the participants in the last 16 of the Conference League and the um, and those that participated in Champions League qualifying, and he worked out which of them are actually challenging for their league title. So you know, have have got not only have they got through to the last sixteen of their European of a European competition, they're also heavily embroiled, uh, you know, in a in a in a title race as well. And there's only three that are top of their leagues, okay, out of, out of those sixteen teams. 
Um, it's only Partizan Belgrade, who are five points clear, Slavia Prague, who are level at the top, and Copenhagen um, are actually leading their leagues. Um, and Porto are the only team in the Europa League, last 16, who are actually leading their league. So there might be a little bit of thing here where, where not only is it really hard to put together a long, unwinning you know, streak at home with the intensity that that takes, and do well in Europe, and do a massive rebuild. So again, I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm not trying to rationalise it, but I thought that was a really interesting piece of analysis. Sorry, to your question. Yeah, no, well, just comment on that, Alan, quick, is I think it speaks to the the challenge of um, competing in the modern game, given the fixture congestion and, um, you know, the demands that places on a squad, let alone one with the circumstances that Celtic have relative to Angie's style play and the rebuild. So I think that's a great, great point. Uh, I, I think we're, um, you know, in my mind, left back center, one center back uh, keeper and probably one more forward. Uh you know, pre preferably a, another winger to add some depth. Now, again, that's assuming that Jota is signed. If not, we're going to need two. Um, and obviously, he's not going to be an easy one to, uh, to, to, you know, quote unquote, replace with a, a comparable quality. But I, I think what we continue to see is um, te teams are able to scheme against us and choose their own adventure, so to speak, with multiple good options as far as how they want to uh, address us playing out from the back. So, and and they, I, any of them can be bad for us. So, if they want to high press us, um, that can create issues for us big time. Um, or if they want to just let our keeper and two center backs have the ball and man mark and kind of cut lanes, which is what Bodo is really good at. Um, then they can go that direction and give us lots of problems. Um, so I, I think our, our ability to have the quality on the ball in that back five with, with the sitting midfielder has to be upgraded in totality. And I think right now we're just, you know, we're, we're three pieces short there uh, at an, at a European level. I mean, I think, you know, I actually think Greg, Greg Taylor's fine for the most part domestically in that role um, in, in build up domestically. But, uh, you know, at that next level European, I think that's where he, he would need an upgrade. But, yeah, the one center back keeper and, you know, at least one more forward. Two center backs of Cameron Carter Vickers was insane as well. That's right. I should have said that. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. you're absolutely right. <laughs> Yeah, it, it just feels like a lot of people are assuming that both these guys are going to sign. And I mean, there's no guarantee that <laughs> these two guys are going to sign. I mean, may not happen. So hopefully there's a, a plan B for that situation. Um, hopefully that is hopefully the the evidence that we have that there is no plan B for that situation is actually fixed now because Ange is getting it sorted. But we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see on that one. I'll give them well, the benefit that, of the doubt. I, I think part of that will hinge on champions of qualification i mean that we i think we need to not only from a, to make us a destination that is going to make them want to be here on the margin you know what i mean that them being able to compete in the champions league both from a profile but also a financial incentives perspective it's is probably material um but also from a financial perspective for us to be able to spend that kind of money which could be what 12 you know, if media reports are, are accurate, 10, 11, 12 million on those two players to buy them. Um, the way the, the finances are working out the club, if we're not in Champions League next year and we're not selling a player to met, meet up an operating gap of, you know, 10 to 12 um, million, I'm not sure where that money would come from uh, mm. without a sale. And I'm not saying we couldn't sell somebody. But then again, then you're having anyone you're going to sell for that kind of money, either singularly or in aggregate, you're then going to have to replace again. So if you sold a Kyogo, I'm not saying we should or we would, but you know what I mean? It, it, there's no subtracting somebody that's going to raise that kind of money that's going to be like, oh, OK, well, not a big deal. <laughs> it's going yeah. to require mm -hmm. a, a replacement. Um, just, just, a just, just ignore the problem, James, like everybody else does, because there's no <laughs> rules to stop you. 
Right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, apologies that we're sort of bouncing around topics here, but it's it's a hard one to sort of navigate your way through and understand just what what quite went wrong and where do you go from here. But just to return to what you were saying, Alan, about the the, the league form of the the teams competing. I mean, it also highlights the there's two things that it highlights it highlights the spread of big teams across multiple european competitions so in theory the europa conference league is for the teams that don't get into europe very often but in practicality leicester are playing in it and leicester have a a massive budget compared to everyone else in the competition europa league similar enough you've got barcelona in the europa league this year as well as several other other really good opposition teams um, who, for reasons domestically, like the Premier League, where West Ham are seventh, I believe, at the minute as the table stands in the Premier League, but they're seventh because they are competing against super clubs who have budgets much bigger than theirs. But if you take West Ham and stick them into the Scottish League, I mean, with the budget that they have at the minute, they would demolish it. So oh, yeah. scored, these, scored six goals at Celtic Park. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so these are the situations that we're talking about here with the, the level of opposition. But likewise, what Bodo and other teams show us is that it is not impossible for Celtic to win these knockout stages. No, because... I mean look at look at I mean look at the players that they've sold. Right, they 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 had some cracking players that they sold, but they're not selling them. To top five teams in the top five leagues, or 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 if they are, they're not top selling them to the top clubs. I mean, I think um, Berg went to Lons, maybe right. So the, 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 and and um, uh, the, the, the I can't remember the name of the the striker that they sold, but I think he went to Krasnodar, right? And now mm. uh, now from Bodo Glimp to Bodo Glimp to up to Krasnodar, he's probably tripled his wages, and and you know they, they'll probably sell him for ten million type of thing. Um, but the point is. That Buda Glimt are selling you know, these really good players to, at best, Europe's middle class, right? Where and 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 Celtic are now firmly in, at best, in in that in that bracket. Whereas we used to be selling players to the top, you know, more, more of the top teams really. So, but but having said all that, you know, you look at that team last night, Buda Glimt's team, and yeah, okay, so you've probably got the the young lad that anchored the midfield, Hagen. You've got. Um, uh, Vetlison, the mid, young midfielder, Norwegian midfielder, and you've got Solbakken, right? Now, those three are young, and they will probably end up being sold f- to decent, solid European teams for five, six, seven million. The rest of them, the rest of them are journeyman players who are, you'd be surprised how old some of them some of them are. Pellegrino on the left wing's 31 years old. The captain, Saltless, who was brilliant. He's 29. He's been at the club all his life. So, but it's identifying the right player to play. That none of these none of these players you'd look at the profile on Wikipedia and think, why would Celtic be interested in that guy, right? But if you put the right player in the right system and have them playing in a coherent way, you don't need to spend four, five, six million pounds on them. And that's the that's the takeaway for me from this. That was if because if that club can do it, and I'm sure they've got very bright people. Uh, who've been given the, the 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 time and the patience and the space to come up with a strategy and to implement it? They obviously have. Um, you need all that backing behind you, but you know there's no reason that Celtic, given the inefficiencies of, of world football, couldn't put together a similarly well assembled squad that wouldn't cost a lot of money. Exactly, and that's my main point because yeah. there's a lot of talk about how you know global football has been taken over by super clubs and all that there. And fair enough, Celtic may never, ever come near winning a European title again just because of the nature of the way football has gone. But that doesn't mean Celtic aren't underperforming what they're currently doing in Europe because they are and have done for the last 20 years. Like that, yeah. that is the reality of it. We, we are underperforming where we should be, even in relative terms. And that's, I think, what is most disappointing. Ma- massively. Yeah. Yeah, James, yeah. Is, James, is, James has made this point repeatedly and, and rightly so. Yeah, ma- massively. And I... I'll call it the Jack Hendry phenomena, right? So we we talked about, um, or I, I mentioned, I think it was last week or the week before. W- one of the things that I've started to delve into is thinking about performance attribution, um, kind of like in the investment world, which is okay. How much of it's the market 
and how much it is is the actual individual um, let's call it stock selection or bond selection. Whereas in in uh, football terms, it would be how much of it is based off of uh, uh, the wage bill disparity. How much of it is the um, the manager style of play? You know, uh, the, the as I, I called it, the the shape of the pieces in the Jenga tower, right? And you get you, you get um, potential benefit from putting players who in sh- systems that capitalize on their relative strengths and minimize their relative weaknesses, right? So you get a guy like Abada who's actually um, in certain ways really well suited for our style of play and put in a position to put up big numbers in our system. How much of that is because of him playing for Celtic and Ange system? How much of it is unique to Lille Abada? How much of Jack Hendry playing in Ustend as the center in a back three made him look better playing the style of play that they did and do how much does that put him in a position where he's then able to be sold for 10 million, which made most Celtic fans go, what the hell is going on here? Right? So there's an ability to have, you know, how much better can you make players look and uh, as a byproduct of that, enhance their value to, for resale purposes, because you're being uh, smart about selecting them and putting them into a style of play that highlights them, like we seem to have done with O'Reilly, hopefully over time, which he seems to be like a, a dreamboat fit for for our style of play. Um, so that, that I, I think it's it, a lot of these things are interconnected, meaning that for us to be able to compete at that level, you know, we're not going to be Salzburg, we're not going to be Ajax. I wouldn't want us to be. When we're different, we have a very different. Um, you know, c- culture and identity at the club, but being able to compete at that level closer to those clubs with our own unique way of doing it, that's the Celtic way, uh, is going to require a higher degree of sophistication in making all of these pieces fit together better. And, and it's a compounding effect if you do. It's you get better performances on the pitch. You get better resale value for your players because you're, you're being thoughtful about how you're picking, recruiting players, developing players all in this way. And it, to me, that's what Bodo represents is they've got a really smart manager. They've got a really disciplined way that they're, they're, they've built their club now and their development. And they're doing all of these things intelligently. And it shows you how they're able to punch above their weight and now starting to get the financial benefits from selling players at levels that five years ago, people would have said, what the hell are these teams doing buying players from Bodo Glimt? Right. So it's that compounding effect that you can take you up levels very quickly. If you get all of these things intelligently uh, designed. Uh, so mm-hmm. to me, that's, what's exciting about it. You look at a Bodo Glimt, which what's possible as Alan has said, you know, this is what we could be just with more resources. And if we scale, that's how we get up to an Ajax. But it, but it, I know you said quickly, but it doesn't happen overnight. And there was, if you looked at last night's lineup, apart from O'Reilly, in fact, only O'Reilly, because Maeda was playing wide left and Giacomacus is, is probably third choice striker. There was only O'Reilly on the pitch that you would say has been bought to fulfill the role that Postacoglu wants him to fit. All of the other players on that pitch are either not first choice or have already proven that that they're not optimal for the system, but we can't change 30 players in, in two transfer windows. So yeah, I, have, I, yeah. When I when I say quickly to me, three or four years is quick, meaning that yeah. you know yeah, this yeah. is more like geologic time, <laughs> which, 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 which <clears throat> is you know within the context of having failed in Europe for you know eighteen years, spending three years to get to where we should be strategically, to be then positioned for the next decade, the next twenty years. Agreed. Yeah. You know, three years is in a, and it's not going to feel like it when we're watching that debacle yesterday, <laughs> you know, yeah. talk about three years in that context. It seems like an eternity. Um, so that's, that's what I meant by, by quick. Hmm. We have spoken for 50 minutes about this game, which I mean, I didn't, I didn't think we'd be able to manage that. To be honest. Yeah, I, only thought, only I thought I had two things to say. It's like a, it's like a, an hour visit to the proctologist. Uh, listen, at, at, at 35 minutes, I was thinking, God, I can't take more, much more of this. Than we've spoken for an, an extra hot. I feel that every week. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else before we 
you know, kill this podcast and move uh, on huge, to the league. Huge game Sunday. I mean, that, that we have a huge game now. And, um, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting. It's going to be a good test because um, Maloney's had more time with Hibs. They've been, you know, we talked about that when we played them last time. Um, you know, they, they're, they're having more time to take on board what he's trying to do. But from a matchup perspective, that might, help us uh because they're going to try and pass the ball out and, unless they have some dramatic shift which I, I would be shocked if they if they do so um you know huge game Ho- hopefully that matchup you know styles make fights as we say uh hopefully that that lends in our direction yeah i hope they try and pass the ball repeatedly across the back line again that's 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 what I'm hoping from from him this weekend. Well, I mean, you know, when did when did Maloney when was he appointed? Now I'm just trying mid, to mid December, I think it was mid December. So he did. It was, look, it was right did... before the cup game, I think, because it was yeah. Okay. Before, yeah. So he did. He did. He did have the um, he did have the transfer window, but I don't. I, I don't. And they did bring a few players in. Uh, this is a few a few new ones, isn't there? Muller, Mitchell, uh, Jasper, uh, who are starting to get game time. But but yeah, I mean he's right at the start of any journey, and, and the way that they played against Celtic at um, Celtic Park was like a you know it was a, a huge step different in terms of how they had been playing under Jack Ross. So that's going to take a lot of um, adjusting to. And again, he doesn't probably have the personnel to play the way that he wants to play. And after an initial flush of enthusiasm, again. They, you know that that defeat at Celtic Park in the beginning of the first game back in January, you know they they hadn't won they did, didn't win a game until last week a, m- a month later but that was one two three four six six uh, league games they didn't win until they beat Ross County um, last weekend so I'm I, I'm I'm expecting them to be a, a bit like a team in transition we'll be back with a full squad. So um, unless something's happened behind the scenes and it's all just collapsed and we don't know about it yet, I would expect a pretty dominant performance. We don't, you know, Easter Road, you've, mm-hmm. we've all been there, played well, dominated the game and left with a draw. You know, sometimes that can happen, but I'd be I'd be hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Well, we shall wait and see. Hopefully <clears throat> it's better than Thursday night. That's all we. That's ultimately <laughs> yeah, all we can hope for when it comes to Celtic. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button if you're not already subscribed and you can get the podcast as well on Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your podcast as well. I'll leave a link to our uh, coffee page as well. If you want to donate or uh, support the channel, you can. And as you can see, for some reason, my camera is bizarrely blurry uh, today. Yeah, I don't too. know what's going on here. So <laughs> It's the most, um, most handsome you've looked in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Touché. If you want to see yeah. my real features that's not hidden by a blurry camera, you can support the channel and help us uh, get some better equipment to, to help it grow. <laughs> James, Alan, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. All right. We'll chat to you later. Good luck.